Thank you all for coming, and I look forward to the next two days. So if I could introduce uh, Louise Bloon and Felisa Taylor to begin with their opening conversation. Thank you. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2012 Louise Bluen Creative Leadership Summit. The entire idea of this is to encourage discussion from every arena, whether it be the arts, academia, science, technology, my passion, business, finance, to encourage innovation, and that's the point of our discussion today. I had the pleasure also yesterday of speaking with the Dallas Federal Reserve President, Richard Fisher, and he very pointedly gave the finger to Congress. And I mean it that way. They haven't provided us with any kind of innovation when it comes to changing what's in front of us in terms of getting the economy started again. But today, we're going to discuss how innovation can make a difference. And it is my pleasure to sit down with you and find out how innovation can make a difference. Louise, why is it so important? Um, it's, it's so important because in the last 15 years, 64% of the job creation uh, was done through small businesses. And that alone as a sentence is a beginning and a conclusion. It's the fuel for the economy. It's the fuel for the economy that fuels health care, that healthcare that is um, well budgeted for. Um, it fuels the education, research and development. It fuels every single discipline. So I find from both parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, there's a lack of focus on that. There's not enough focus on how are we going to create those jobs. Exactly the point. And this is what I was discussing with Mr. Fisher yesterday. What happened to job creation? It's great to have QE3, but does that create jobs? And the answer is no. The point is that Congress has to implement taxation in terms of providing breaks for corporations and incentivizing them. That's part of innovation. Absolutely. Um, I think that we have to start um, in terms of our education. The education that we have today was built for the needs of 60 years ago. I think that was my back. <laughs> um, so the, the question is, how should education be today? And if I look at um, what it took me as an entrepreneur to build uh, twice a different sort of businesses, you don't need a lot. You just have to identify in the marketplace where there's a need. You have to find the void. You have to find the unknown. And that's, it can be difficult, and sometimes it is extremely difficult. So you're asking individuals to get out of their comfort zone and to go see what they don't see naturally. So that's creativity for me. So the education system should maybe look at the development of the senses. What is important is to be able to hear. 7% of your neurons are based on hearing. Different, different scientists might argue that number, but it's about 7%. 27% is, is about uh, viewing the eye. If we know that, why don't we develop that? Because when you start looking and you start hearing, you can then compose, you learn, you assimilate, you start learning things. So if, um, and the question is, is how do we do it? How do we actually ask a child to develop their eye? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very much into the news of the arts and I've been, since a child, visiting museums and being pulled by my mother to go see museums and look at paintings and all that. But I've which really... Which is a good thing. Which is a great <laughs> thing, which is a great thing. But um, I think that I've really concentrated more on that in the last 15 years. And my eye is very different today than 15 years ago. 
So why not tap in to our senses? Because there's so much of it that hasn't been developed. I'll give you an example of um, when you kiss someone, why do you actually close your eyes to start feeling more? Wait, I don't always. So, so okay, not always, but sometimes, sometimes. So <laughs> if sometimes, you know, why do we actually, sometimes when you want to think more, you start and you close your eyes and you start visualizing things in your head. So because you want to think more and you want to hear and you want to feel more. So if you're kissing someone and you have your closed eyes, you'll actually feel the kiss more. So do we have to wait? So does that mean that we go back into a little bit of a fantasy? So um, innovation is created through fantasy? No, you're tapping in to your other senses because you want to accentuate that feeling. Wow, I didn't know we were going to go here. OK. <laughs> so no, but this is very important. I thought important. this was very serious. I don't know, but this is, this is very important. Because if you don't tap into anything, the robot, the robot doesn't tap into anything. He'll do that job. But you need to add something, something else, which is all about feeling and developing what you have and so that you can create. You can't create out of nothing. You've got to start creating because you can create when you put things together. And putting things together, you have to tap into your senses. The robots are going to take a lot of the jobs. They, they already have. So what can the human being develop that the robot doesn't have? That's the first thing, because you want to create employment. So, and the question is, how do we do that? Well, why not, why not start by um, using art as a tool? If you look at a painting, uh, and, and on that painting, you have two individuals quarreling, mm -hmm. you can have a history class. You can develop the eye of the children by looking at it. You can engage and you can say, okay, are they fighting these people? So you can go in psychology, start interacting. And you can learn something about the painter. So why not use music to develop your eyes? So it seems all these things seems to be very soft. And the first thing that in our not. educational system. It's the root. It's and the, the fundamental. Root. It's the root of our civilization. It's the root. Every time I hear of a budget cut, they cut the arts. And that's not where they should be cutting, because that's the creative part, is how to teach children how they want to actually paint, how to look, how to develop. So that's essential. The first thing that's essential is education, and uh, so that we become more creative people and less of a commodity. Mm -hmm. um, when you read something, it's absolutely boring if it's not in context. So we have to teach people how to put things in context. We have to teach them to think beyond the borders. And it's very, very, very difficult. As an entrepreneur, um, my first business was in the classified business. I was sort of the, the eBay with 18 million bits of things, of things to, uh, to sell. And I remember coming out of, uh, when I first bought my first company, there was four magazines. I love that. When I bought my first company. Isn't that a great thing <laughs> to be able to say? I bought my first company. I leverage do buyout. That. <laughs> five million, five million, five million of leverage buyout, five million of financing and 200,000 of deposit, which you could never do today. today. And that's the problem. That brings us to the financing challenges. But, but the other thing that happened is that when I got out of the lawyer's office, I met a friend. I don't know if you can call him a friend anymore, but anyway. So he tells me, how can you ever buy that piece of junk? And you know, you're just getting out, you've just done a leverage buyout, debt of five million, one two hundred thousand. So the rule is don't listen to others when you're gonna create. Because they won't build your confidence level. So that's education, and part of the education is not only tapping into your senses, but giving you courage and motivation. Mm -hmm. Some of the system of education, if I look at uh, France, France is very good and very rigorous at the start, but that sort of model is not recommended after because it kills creativity and you want to motivate people. So I think that on the educational side, the senses and motivation is very important. Financing is key. As I said, I could have never done my first deal today. 
We know that the small businesses create jobs. And that is a very a serious point that we have today. We have, what, 8% of unemployment, but really with the underemployed, we're probably at 14%, which is mm -hmm. extraordinary. I have my son that just graduated from Columbia University. He has Can a, he job. Find a job. He had a job? He has a job, but most, most of them don't. Right. I mean, this is serious. And the other thing that we have is that a lot of them can't have visas. And they have, you know, great minds. So anyway, so that's another problem. But I want to go back to financing. I would say follow the cash. Where is the cash? The cash is I was in gonna say, is there cash? Yes, there is cash, but there's maybe not in the same. The there's plenty. Lines. There's plenty of there's cash. There's plenty of it. The Federal Reserve has just given us more. No, but it doesn't have to come from the government. That's what we, we have to sort of there's a few options. One of them. Why not repatriate the money that's out there, give them a tax break, bring back the money mm -hmm. to the United States and tell them, well, if you have a good tax break, then a percentage of that will go to funding small businesses. There's a lot of money out there outside of the borders of America. Another way, uh, why not ask an individual to take the risk and get a tax break when he does invest. Actually, there was this, a plan in Quebec called the QSSP plan. And the QSSP plan was Quebec Stock Savings Plan, where when you invested $100 in a company, then you would get a tax break of 25%. Wow. Or 35%, depending on the risk level or the size. So that's another way, because individuals are sitting on a lot of cash. We're so frightened to put it anywhere because you know the market goes up and down. All this, there are so, no answers. So and there's no a lot of unanswered things are happening, and then it's sort of frightening what's happening. Um, so so if we give that, so the individual have cash, so they can get a tax break. The the money that's sitting outside of the borders of America, there's a lot of money. So I think because banks, and then the other thing that we have to deal with is that banks prefer some of them trading than actually investing in small businesses mm -hmm. because they make more money. So we've cool. got to go back and, and um, create that glass seagull. That was a glass seagull? Glass seagull. Well, and, and, and put it back in place and make sure that banks lend to small businesses. That's key. So if you don't have on one side the financing and that you don't have a, an education that stimulates all this, it just, it's hard to make it happen because already as an entrepreneur, you sweat every single day to try to figure out where's the next customer, how to refine your mission, how do you refine your product. How but even to, where I'm, you're gonna be in a year from now. And as, as a small business, if you can't think five years down the road, where, how could you possibly exist? And that's what I think was so frustrating. And that's where innovation <coughs> comes into play. It's so important to think in a bigger way? Think, think in a bigger way. Um, my problem in entrepreneurship is that the frustration thing is that, the frustrating bit is that you have an idea, you have a vision, a lot of people don't see it. So already you have got this, this challenge of convincing people that you are right or that you're going somewhere. Um, but it's very hard. So not only you have the educational challenge, you have the financing, and that you have, then you have the good resources, the best resources that you can have are people. Mm. And you have to bring them with you in that vision. So there's a lot of elements, but it's not only, innovation is not only about business, it's about, about a scientist making discovery. It's about uh, you know, a technology. It's about, that is really the core of a country. That's the DNA. Innovation is the DNA. And I think that, that if we had to, to speak in terms of being a candidate to uh, an election, the future president, there's only that to talk about because that solves the problems of a lot of things. So if we have money in the bank, if people are employed, then we will be able to pay the bills 
and we will have pensions for the people that are older. We won't, you know, on CNBC this morning, someone was saying that... Um, Wait, that's oh, the competition. Wait, no, sorry, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to say something <laughs> nice about that. Oh, no, hold on. So CNBC, what happened, they said that, um, w well, maybe people should engage and start paying for their older age. That's most of the cost of the How? health care is at the end of your life. So isn't that where you need it? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just so, beginning to understand that, by the way. Yeah, so, so, so <laughs> anyway, healthcare, the, the problem with healthcare for me that I see is that it's, um, it's, um, it, it costs too much. I mean, there's no oh, control on expenses. It's you so expensive. So expensive. I don't know how Americans are able to survive without healthcare. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how unfair it is. Well, I think, I believe that everyone should have health care, but it has to be controlled. Um, de delivering a baby today costs, in some hospitals, twenty to 30000 It yeah. used to cost 3000 So how can we afford it? So an how do you absorb that? Yeah, you can't afford it. So we have to have innovative ideas to come out with plans that make sense and uh, that control costs. This is exactly the whole point of why this summit exists, is to discuss innovation, to discuss ideas, to bring together everyone in this room and all of the delegates that are here to make sure that these ideas continually are encouraged. And I thank you so much for thank bringing you. us all together because well, it's, a, it's a fantastic, fantastic summit. So we will continue. Thank you I very much. I appreciate the discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.